to Paul Nyamuda. Paul, over to you, my friend. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Timba. Um, <clears throat> Timba is such a great friend of mine and uh, such a great blessing. Uh, we've known each other since, since high school. We used to go to high school camps back in the day with each other. And um, yeah, it was really great. And um, it's such an honor and such a privilege to be sharing with you guys. Um, <clears throat> I also noticed some great names coming through. Sandy Lengwe, I was his uh, best man. It's great to see you there, Sandy Le, and um, a number of other people. I know I've got, um, I've got a number of people who were in my webinar this morning. I did a Gibbs one um, on, on a different theme. And um, really great that some of you guys have joined. Um, I think Rochelle and a couple of other people. Um, so people are hungry for this kind of thing, leading and managing your emotions. I'm going to talk fast. As uh, you heard Timber saying that Paul is into information. I'm hoping that this evening will not just be information, but it will be revelation. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to turn down my heater. I've got a heater down here. I've got this jacket and other things inside the jacket because of the cold front. So I'm going to just turn things down and <laughs> falling asleep on you guys. Okay. Um, all right. So, <laughs> so let's go for it. <laughs> let's go for it. Uh, here's the important principle, ladies and gentlemen. You can actually, you can actually control the state of your physiology and your mentality. It's so important to understand that. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And the nature of this talk is um, it's not going to be point by point by point. Okay, It's going to be nuggets around emotional intelligence, emotional agility, uh, leading and managing your emotions. So when we talk of emotional intelligence, there are usually four major pillars we focus on. Okay, In, First is emotional self-awareness. The second is emotional management. Okay, And those are the two we'll focus on today because they fit into this theme. Um, the third one is social awareness, being aware of other people, and then afterwards it's relationship management, and you're going to deal with that uh, with the webs, okay? So the first thing I want to say to you is that you are powerful. You are powerful, and it's such a powerful concept to have. You are powerful, okay? I can, literally, I can shape my future based on how I think, based on how I feel about things, okay? I can choose my emotions. You know, athletes condition themselves at an emotional level, emotional conditioning, right? They prime themselves, they visualize, and then they perform well, right? And research has backed that up. But somehow, as, as human beings in everyday life, we tend to just roll out of bed and then just pitch up. <laughs> Have you noticed that? I remember I was doing a workshop some time ago for a particular PR company, and um, the, the head of it, the CEO, she's in her early 40s, she says, with you millennials, and she was talking about some, you know, some of the people who work for her, what do you do? Do you just roll out of bed and just pitch up, um, pitch up at work? Because when I arrive at work, you see me sometimes in my vehicle, this is her speaking, and I'm literally preparing for the day. I'm doing certain things, certain rituals I have just to get ready for the day. That's what I do. That's what she said. But it seems like with some of you millennials, just roll out of bed and just arrive, okay? Um, so we want to live by design, not by default. That's why we want to lead and manage our emotions. That's why we want to take charge of our emotions. And we've got the power to do so. Each time you say, when my hubby starts doing A, B, C, D, then I'll be happy. Then you're speaking from a place of victim stance. You're speaking from a place of powerlessness. Okay? And that's not our portion in life. So you can make a decision today if you haven't already made that decision that, you know what, I'm powerful. And power is not just about muscles. I know you've got gym guys like Temba and other people and so on, but power is not just about muscle. Power is also about being mentally strong because when you're mentally strong and you, you take charge of your mental state, it influences your emotional state, okay? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. How do we love God with our mind, okay? How we love him with our mind, when we consecrate our mind to him, influences the state of our emotions, okay? We can, we can say a whole lot about that, okay? This, so you're powerful. Nothing wrong with power. Power is A's ability to make B do something B would otherwise not have done. And when power is exerted, it becomes influence, right? 
So if I say to you, oh, we had an outage the other day and we didn't have any power. If you're a kind, caring, reasonable human being, you feel for me, right? You feel for me. So we're fine with power when we're talking about ESCOM. But when we talk about being a powerful person, people think we're being arrogant. There's nothing wrong with power. The problem is the abuse of power. That's what the problem is, okay? So let's embrace power. Uh, we are powerful people, okay? Just say that out. I am powerful. Like, say it quite loudly. It's good that we're all muted, but just shout it out, okay? I am powerful. Okay, some people unmuted themselves for that. Cool, it was, just, it was nice to hear that. So you are powerful. You are powerful. Happiness is a choice, okay? Uh, and that's very important. So I want to, I want to go into the next thing and just, and just highlight that you can actually control the state of your physiology and your mentality, okay? Have you noticed that if your physiological state is very healthy, you don't react to certain things the way you would ordinarily react to them? That's why as human beings, we don't react in the same way all the time, right? Think about it. Those of you who are married, you know what it's like in marriage where you might say something to your spouse or act in a certain way or not do a particular thing. One day it upsets them. On another day, they're fine with it, okay? What's actually happening? It's to do with their physiological state, okay? Now, the thing is, do I determine my own physiological state? Of course I do. There's certain things I can do. I know what I'm like. If I've just been on a run, as a runner, if I go and I run, come back and so on, there's a certain mood that I'm in. Okay, and certain things, if they're said to me, or the kids do that, or don't do that, or don't listen to me, it just bounces off. Okay, whereas when my physiological state isn't in a healthy space, what happens? I become irritable. So the thing to do is, as we as we on this journey of managing our emotions, let's let's be proactive about it, and manage our physiological state. Okay, so so important. Now, some key verses I want to share with you, and I'm aware of the fact that um, there are many different people from different church backgrounds uh, who are watching this. So I'm not going to use Christianese. I'm going to uh, be very inclusive in how I speak, but I'm also going to hopefully show you that the word of God is very powerful. Um, the Bible is very powerful and answers all the questions of life. Okay. Um, so in Romans 8 verse 37, it says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And just, so just bear that in mind, at the back of your mind, as we go through this process of managing our emotions, that I am more than a conqueror. Not I'm a conqueror, I'm more than a conqueror. But I find it interesting because it doesn't just end there. It says, through whom who loved us. Through him who loved us. See, many people use this as an affirmation. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm more than a conqueror. But their mindset isn't through him who loved me. So how do I become a conqueror of negative emotions? How do I become a conqueror who's so resilient and doesn't crumble, right? It's by having a revelation that I'm loved by God. And many people have an understanding that they're loved by God, but they don't have an understanding that they're also a delight to him. Do you remember when Jesus was being baptized? What did Father God say? He says, this is my beloved son. Okay, beloved, that's where we get the name David from. It means beloved of God. So this is the son whom I love. This is my beloved son. Then he goes on to say, with whom I'm well pleased. Before Jesus had even done any miracle, so he hadn't performed yet. So it wasn't like God was saying, I'm pleased with your performance. He's just saying, I'm pleased with you, period, right? And think of all those scriptures. He rejoices over me in singing. When we embed ourselves in this, in this type of love, where Jesus says, remain in my love, okay? What does love do? It casts out fear. Can you see the link between knowing you're loved and being more than a conqueror? How do I conquer fear? I have a revelation that I'm loved and I'm a delight to him. Okay? Love never fails. Right? So again, I want to encourage you that when you go about this, don't, don't try and have affirmations to overcome fear isolated from Christ. We're talking about Christ-centered conquering. Okay? That's what I want to, to encourage you. And when I talk about being Christ-centered, Christ as he is, not as we try to make him out to be, all right? Um, 1 John 4, verse 4, it says, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. That's another key scripture for me. The one who's in me 
is greater than the one who's in the world. You know, you, you know what I do? Uh, since about 2011, whenever people say to me, Paul, how's life treating you? I say to them, I'm treating it well, thank you. When people say to me, Paul, how's married life? I've been married almost 18 years. How's married life? Um, I, I'm treating it well, thank you, right? Can you see where I'm coming from, right? Um, so how's married life treating you? I'm treating it well, thank you. When we moved from four ways to St. Turin in 2010, how's St. Turin treating you? I'm treating it well, thank you. I say that because the influence and impact I have on the world around me is bigger than it has on me. That's the mindset of powerful people and every single person on this webinar is powerful. You are powerful, okay? Very, very important. So, so important, okay? Um, so, so when the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, that's not just about casting out demons. It's a mindset that says the influence and impact I have on the world around me is bigger than it has on me, okay? So I can be crawling in traffic at 5Ks an hour and I'm on a highway or motorway, if there's anyone from the UK who's watching, right? I'm, I'm parked off there. I can't do anything about it. I'm late for a client. I've already made a decision that I'm a joyful person. I'm not going to let the traffic control my level of joy. My level of joy is greater than what the traffic can do to me. But how do most people live their lives? To be honest with you, the moment they get into that open plan situation in the workplace, what are they asking? What mood is the boss in today? What mood is the boss in today? Right? And if the boss is in a bad mood, then you spend your whole day trading on eggshells because your boss is in a bad mood. And I say to people, don't let someone else's weakness control your emotional state. Okay? Don't let someone else's weakness control your emotional state. How many of you in the last six months have used the phrase, she just drives me up the wall? Okay, many of us, right? Or he just drives me up the wall. Maybe more hands go up, right? And I ask people the question, does he physically place you on top of his bonnet and drive you up the wall? No, you end up up the wall because you were in reaction mode. You were reacting, not responding, okay? So... Powerful people are in charge of their mind. They don't have stinking thinking, okay? And that's where the battle is, right? When we talk about self-control, it's not just about controlling what my physical body does, okay? And when we talk about self-control, it's also about a sound mind. So it's known as a sound mind or self-controlled mind. Why? Because I'm controlling also how I'm thinking. It's very difficult to talk about emotions without talking about thoughts, okay? Because the two are very very linked. So um, these scriptures, very, very powerful. And by the way, we're going to actually get, um, we, we'll do a PDF of, of these, these slides, and they can be sent through to you. Okay. So powerful scriptures that I wanted to share with you as a foundation. Okay. Now, our mind is one of the most powerful assets God has given us. One of the most powerful assets God has given us. But what tends to happen is we're good at servicing our vehicles, washing our vehicles, looking after things, physical things. But few of us are good at guarding our minds, really guarding our minds, servicing your mind, doing an audit of your thoughts. Okay? So important to be able to do that. Okay? And to have filters. It's like we have filters for bad oil and so on, right? But to also have filters here yeah, in terms of what goes into my eye gate, what goes into my ear gate, because that influences my emotional state, okay? So your mind is one of the most powerful assets that God has given you, and we need to get our minds working for us, you see? If I've got a CPU, those of you in IT, all right, central processing unit, Bible says I've got the mind of Christ, okay? That's such a powerful statement. I've got the mind of Christ, okay? Now, if I've got that as my CPU, that's a powerful asset. I must use it. I must use my imagination to glorify God, to create things. We were created in God's image, okay? So we can also create. We can also develop. We can also innovate, all right? So I need to use it for that. Now, what tends to happen is we often feel down because we keep going back to negative thoughts. Have you noticed that? If you say to me, Paul, I'm really feeling low today. I'll ask you, if I'm coaching you, I'll ask you the question, at what point did you start feeling low? 
And I can tell you right now, we'll be able to find a certain point where that triggered that emotional state. And, you, and if I'm close to you and observing you, I'll say it was when you got off the phone with so-and-so. Okay. And after you got off the phone with so-and-so, there was a way you interpreted what that person said to you. And that's the thing that's destroying you. You see, the thing that destroys us isn't other people's words. It's how we interpret those words and how many times we then rehearse what we've interpreted. You're not destroyed by other people's words. You're not destroyed by your experiences. You're destroyed by the story you tell yourself about your experiences. So when you're feeling low, when you're feeling down, the key thing to do is to actually say, how can I reinterpret the event that triggered this emotion? I'm hoping that makes sense, okay? So why do we always go back to those negative thoughts, right? Or those misbeliefs, things that aren't even based on truth, okay? Let me ask you a question. Do you replay, do you keep replaying a video that you don't like? When we watch certain movies at home that my wife and I like, sometimes if my kids have watched it before, they're like, oh, no, 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 I'm going upstairs. I'm going to bed. I'm going to play my computer because I don't want to watch this. We typically don't rewatch videos, movies. You see, I'm old school, videos, all right? <laughs> By scopes. <laughs> okay, we typically don't watch things that we don't like on TV. But have you noticed that we keep doing that when it comes to our thoughts? So we replay it and we replay it, and then we add salt, we add pepper, right? We add ketchup, we add all sorts of things to it. Why do we do that? It's very dangerous because the thing is your subconscious mind, the subconscious, okay? doesn't actually differentiate between fact and fantasy. That's quite a scary thought. Your subconscious doesn't distinguish between fact and fantasy. So that means that, for example, let me give you an example. If you're watching a horror movie, I don't know why people watch horror movies, okay? But if you're watching a horror movie, what happens? You're there, you're all scared, you're all frightened, right? But you know mentally that, wait a minute, that actor, yeah, he acts in that comedy that we watched two weeks ago. So you know it's fictitious. But when you hear the music and you have the visual of everything that's happening, often the music has a big impact, doesn't it? Okay. And what happens when you go to bed, right? Let's say it's summertime. Your windows are open. The wind is blowing, right? The curtain. You're thinking that thing is going to jump into my room and come and get me. You might even dream about it. So your subconscious, your heart, whatever you want to call it, right? Your, your brain, right? is storing it up as a real experience. So what typically happens is we have an experience that triggers us into a negative emotional state because of the story we are telling us, telling ourselves about it, right? Our interpretation of it. And we keep rehearsing something that isn't actually true. Our interpretation is often based on filters, on childhood wounds, like, oh, they don't like me. They think I'm lazy, right? And it affects your biology. It affects your physiology. And it affects how you end up reacting to other things afterwards. Okay? Now, here's the thing. When you're thinking about your emotional state, ask yourself, what's this negative emotion saying to me? Because our emotions have messages. So whether you're experiencing a positive emotion or a negative emotion, right, isn't always the issue. The issue is what you do with your emotions because negative emotions are communicating something to you, okay? So for example, I was feeling a bit anxious about something yesterday, but at a certain point I had to press pause and I had to say, why am I feeling anxious about this? And I realized that it was because of how I was interpreting the particular event, okay? It was to do with an upcoming event. It was the way I was interpreting it and I had to reinterpret it and then it, has, it affected my emotional state, right? With regards to that particular thing. Sometimes you can feel angry about something. Let's say you give your son something, nice present or something like that, right? And they don't really communicate that much appreciation. They say, thanks, dad, like you've just given them a sweet. 
and then this anger rises up in you, stop, press pause and just say, what's this anger communicating to me? It could be a message basically saying to you, you know what, Paul, when you got your son that, there was something you wanted in return. You wanted him to like you more or respect you more. So anger is often due to blocked goals. So your, your goal was blocked, Paul, right? And you're now angry because you didn't get what you were really going for. So that anger reveals to me that there were ulterior motives when I gave him the gift. It was love with a hook. It wasn't a pure love. It wasn't a sincere love. You know, in, in Peter, it says, love one another. And it's using the word philos there. Okay, Philadelphia is the full thing. The brotherly affection, which is important, right? That emotional connection. Love one another with a pure heart, fervently. A pure heart, deeply. Okay? So, sometimes our emotions reveal to us our motives. You see? Then when you deal with the motive, then you're fine with it. Okay? Oh, okay, cool, right? So your emotions send you messages, okay? Um, sometimes we've got misbeliefs like, let's say you're starting a new job in sales. If you keep saying, ah, it's my first time doing sales. Oh, that's why I'm so nervous because it's my first time. It's my first time doing sales. You get into an emotional state because of what you're saying. That's the first thing, okay? The first thing. You get into an emotional state because of what you're saying. But what you're saying is not actually factually true because you can bring in a counter argument to that and you can say, but is it really my first time doing sales? Because I'm always selling, actually. I'm always selling my ideas. I'm always influencing. I'm always negotiating. Because that's what selling is. It's influencing and negotiating. So the moment you tell yourself a different story, what happens? Your emotional state starts to change. What story do you tell yourself? You see... We often focus very much on what we say to other people and we forget that probably what's very, very important in life, that's an anchor in our lives, is what we say to ourselves. And some of the stuff we say to ourselves, we would go to jail if we said the same thing to other people. You know? You make a mistake. Oh, silly. Oh, how could I have done it? Oh, would you do that? If your son or daughter makes a small mistake, would you go and hit them on the head and say, oh, silly? Okay, maybe some of you, I don't know. But the point I'm making is that we treat ourselves so badly, you see. I've got no right to just treat myself anyhow. Why? I belong to Christ. I was bought for a price. I was redeemed, right? The word redeemed means bought back. So Jesus died for me on the cross, okay? And I now belong to him. I can't just treat myself anyhow. I'm God's property, okay? It's so important. And for many people, they, they struggle with self-hatred and it affects their emotional state, okay? So we must learn to use our negative emotions. You see, pain, even painful emotions, aren't all bad. That's what I'm trying to highlight here. You know, um, it's good that I feel pain when um, I bump into something or if I put my hand on a stove I, it's good that I feel pain, right? Some people have died. Some people have literally died because they had certain life-threatening ailments, but they, they didn't feel any pain. You know, you hear stories of so-and-so actually had a big tumor, but it wasn't actually sore, so they didn't think much about it. And they ended up dying because it was too late, okay? So when you have those negative emotions, let them work for you, use them and say, What's going on? What's the problem here? Okay. I hate feeling fearful. I don't like the idea of being intimidated by anyone. So the moment I start feeling intimidation or feeling a bit funny, I need to press pause and ask myself, why am I feeling this? Is it because I've put this person on a pedestal? Is it because I have put this person as an idol? Is it because I need their validation? There's something wrong with that. And the moment I repent of that way of thinking, what happens? It frees me up at the emotional level, okay? So don't dwell on the negative emotion, right? Um, because that has other consequences, but rather let it point you in the right direction. So I want to ask you, what do you typically do with your emotions? What do you typically do with your emotions, right? Do you suppress them? Be careful of suppressing your emotions, okay? Uh, because whatever you resist will persist, okay? 
Whatever you resist will persist. In other ways, in other words, it will come out in other in other ways. Okay. There's a particular lady, she was known as such a kind person. People say, oh, she's super kind, she's super kind. But she got depressed and she ended up going into therapy for depression. And what was interesting was that at a certain point, because her husband wasn't treating her well and all of that, and she was just generally depressed, but she was a super nice person. But at a certain point, she just exploded in the session, right? And with anger, right? And she was surprised by herself. She was actually quite surprised by it, right? Um, but the point I'm making is that very often depression is actually anger turned inward. So if you're not articulating your disappointments, your frustrations in a healthy, constructive way, very often you turn in on yourself, right? And it's anger turned inward and it becomes depression. You know the people I'm talking about who bottle things up and then one day they explode and everyone is shocked. Like, oh, what's happening? So are you suppressing your emotions? just so you can survive? Or are you enduring them? Have you got that mindset of, I must, I must just soldier on. Cowboys don't cry, you know? Also not healthy. Do you embrace them as part of your personality? You know, some people are just like, eh, that's just me, I'm afraid of those things and I'm afraid of that or that makes me nervous. Fear is not your portion, right? As the book of Timothy says, you've, been not, you've not been given a spirit of, timidity or spirit of fear but a spirit of power love and a sound mind okay so some people have become friends with fear and the moment you call it what it is it's amazing what ends up happening you have some people say i'm just shy i'm just so shy i'm the shy type of person no call it what it is sometimes it's social phobia sometimes it's i'm i'm afraid of speaking out what i think because i'm afraid of being judged oh i've got the fear of man I'm bound by a man-pleasing spirit. Let's call it what it is. There's nothing wrong with being quiet, being a quiet person, if that's how you choose to be in a particular setting. But when I talk about shyness, I'm basically talking about uh, that feeling afterwards of, I wish I had said this, I wish I had said that. And you start kicking yourself because you didn't speak up, you see? And you're like, oh, that person stole my point. Why am I so afraid? That's not your portion, okay? So... Um, do you embrace it as part of your personality? Have you kind of settled that that's just me? You know, some people say to me, no, Paul, I'm not like that. That's just not me. I, I'm not like, and I say to them, how do you know? You've, you've got a narrow definition of yourself. Who said that's you? Because human beings have got an amazing capacity to just to change, to transform. We all know people who used to be shy and timid, and now they're just so different. Okay. So how have you defined yourself? You use them as currency. You know, you have some people who just, who actually use them as currency. What do I mean by that? Where you literally like, oh, you know what? Let me, let me just be very emotional. Let me talk to everyone about this so they feel sorry for me, you know? Becomes part of your attention-seeking behavior, okay? Do you share them by venting and dumping on others? Just because you share your emotional state doesn't actually solve the problem. The problem is solved when you think right concerning the situation. Okay, and you allow that emotion to send the right message to you where you say, oh, okay, this is what the actual issue is, right? So your emotions help you to diagnose that there's a problem, it shows you that there's a problem and helps you in the diagnosis pro uh, process, okay? Venting is actually just a temporary release in terms of dealing with anger, but you find yourself just venting again, venting again, venting again, and dumping on others, okay? So what we should actually do with our emotions is learn from them and utilize them, okay, for our growth. That's what we should actually be doing, okay? So although there is nothing you can do to change your past, you can change the way you look at it. You can also take control of how it affects your relational patterns. That's what we've been talking about, okay? We react and respond to things based on the state of our minds, okay? So, for example, I believe in the scripture that says I was fearfully and wonderfully made, okay? I believe that with all my heart. So, when someone insults me, if someone says to me, you ugly thing, right? I don't feel hurt. I actually feel sorry for them because my mindset is, why would someone say that to another human being, okay? 
would they say that? What, what, who would speak like that? It bounces off me. I remember when we were at school, right? In all my years of high school, we won the school athletics. We started losing, uh, well, not coming first uh, when I left high school. And not because of me, but I'm just saying that's just what happened statistically, right? We were winning from when I was there, Form 1, and then when I ended, we were still winning. So if another school came and said, oh, we're better than you guys, hey, we're much better than you guys, and so on, it didn't affect me because I knew who we were, okay? So it's very important to be comfortable in love, to abide in love, to remain in love. And it's called emotional object constancy, right? Where we've received the love of God and we've internalized it and we take it wherever we go. When a little baby is still a little baby, it hasn't got emotional object constancy, right? So when the parents come in, they cuddle the baby and soothe it in terms of what they say, then the baby goes quiet. The moment they leave the room, the parents, the, the parents leave the room, the baby then starts crying because in the baby's mind, mom and dad have gone. They don't exist anymore, right? Then the parents keep coming in. After some time of being nurtured that way, the child reaches emotional object constancy where they internalize that particular love, right? They internalize the validation. So there's spiritual object constancy where we are called to do the same thing. We read the word, we remind ourselves of the love of God and we walk in that. And I'm telling you, when you do that, things bounce off you. They literally bounce off you, negative things. You end up with a bulletproof self-image, okay? Now, your mental state, your mental state affects the meaning you attach to life events at any given moment. The thing that affects you is the meaning you attach to that particular event. That's what destroys us, okay? So a powerful question to ask yourself is, if I'm feeling this way about such and such, what's the meaning I've attached to this, right? If my husband isn't talking to me that much today, what meaning have I attached to it? For some people, it's, oh, he's not talking to me that much. He must be going through stuff. Is he feeling stressed out? Let me pray for him. Let me ask him if there's anything I can do. Honey, do you need a back rub? With other people who've already got a negative narrative about themselves, immediately going to default of, he's ignoring me, he's rejected me, he doesn't love me anymore. So two different people can have exactly the same experience, right? But one of them is interpreting it through their own filters. And they end up having an emotional reaction that causes an unnecessary fight, right? Because of their mental state, okay? So that's very important. So let me ask you some questions just in terms of your self-awareness, right? Do you know how engaged you are right now? Another way of asking that is, how do you feel right now about your job, for example? You know, human resources people talk about staff engagement, and they'll tell you that when, when staff members are very engaged, their performance goes up. So just ask about your engagement. Ask yourself about your engagement with regards to your job, with regards to your church, with regards to your spouse, with regards to your kids, with regards to your friends. And you can decide how engaged you're going to be. Okay? So what a lot of people don't understand is their pillars of engagement. The first pillar is dedication. So if you want people to be really engaged, it's also about saying, hey, how committed are you to this? How committed are you to your spouse? for example, and making that decision. When I, when, I'm, when I have that top of mind that I love my wife, I want to be there for her, and each day I make that commitment, maybe my devotional time, right? My engagement will then go up. The second pillar of engagement is vigor. How much energy do I actually have with regards to this particular thing? And sometimes my energy levels are influenced by my health by uh, how I'm eating. You know, am I eating a lot of high glycemic foods, for example? And am I always having sugar lows, et cetera? That vigor will affect my emotional reaction to certain things. The third pillar of engagement is absorption. That's the degree to which you can immerse yourself fully into something. Am I listening attentively? Am I absorbed in what I'm doing? Do people have to pull me away from it and say, Paul, it's time to eat now? And the more absorbed you are in the particular thing, the more likely you are to, to get into the zone and to perform better, okay? So that's to do with self-awareness. 
How engaged are you right now? Something that's almost the opposite of engagement is burnout. And there are two pillars of burnout. The one pillar is exhaustion. Are you feeling exhausted right now? Now, you can feel exhausted, but it doesn't mean you're burnt out. The second pillar is lethal, cynicism. If you're already feeling exhausted and you mix your exhaustion with being cynical, very dangerous. Let me give you some examples of real life situations of cynical thoughts, okay, that people have had. I was dealing with a particular organization and uh, these were some of the things, I'm not exaggerating, these are some of the things people said to me in that organization. Paul, because of the way I've been treated here, uh, this person was a lawyer, by the way, uh, really jacked up, really good at what they did. But Paul, because of the way I've been treated here, I've decided I'm not going to take work home anymore. Uh, just to keep sane, I just come to work and I look at the clock and I count down eight and a half hours. That's what I'm now doing. Okay, That's cynicism, right? Very negative. Another person, Paul, you know what? The pension here is good. The person was only about 44 at the time. Paul, the pension here is really good. From now onwards, I'm just going to keep my head down. I'm not going to make any comments in meetings uh, because Paul here, if you speak up, you get walloped. So that's me now. Another person, that organization, Paul, you know what? Um, there are no jobs for me here. You know, everything has been earmarked for other people. So this, this, is, this place is not for me. Okay. Another person, that same organization, Paul, the problem here is that when, these, when you set up meetings with your leaders, they, they come, but for that 30 minutes, they're just pretending to listen. They're not really listening. Okay. So what I say to people is write out all your cynical thoughts that you have concerning a particular situation. And then next to that thought, write out the counter arguments. In other words, the truth of the situation. Okay. So for example, that person who's saying There's, there are no places for me here, right, in this organization, if someone is saying that, maybe it's actually factually true. But I then say to them, what's the counter argument? They could say, you know what, even if there's no place for me here, I'm surrounded by smart people and I'm going to maximize my time here and learn as much as I can from them. So I'm going to seek them for mentorship. Okay. So you're pouring your energy into something that's productive as opposed to living from a place of victim stance, right? Because of cynicism, okay? Why is it important to come up with counter arguments to your negative thinking? It's because of the psychology of thought suppression. You can't really suppress your thoughts. Have you noticed that? If you say, uh, if I say to you, don't think of an apple, just don't, th guys, please try not to think of an apple. Please, please do not think, especially a green one. Don't think of a green apple. What are you gonna think of? A green apple, right? But if I just say to you, think of a banana, there's no chance you're going to be thinking of a green apple, right? So what you do is you can't suppress your thoughts. Try not to suppress your thoughts. Rather displace your thoughts with what you should actually be thinking. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about renewing the mind, okay? So you counter the negative thoughts with healthy thinking, okay? So that's very important. So... How engaged are you right now? Have you reached burnout, which is a combo of exhaustion and cynicism, okay? Very important. Write down your cynical thoughts and next to them, the counter arguments. In other words, what else could be true? One of the most powerful questions I find as a coaching question, when you're coaching people or you're coaching yourself, self-coaching is this one. It's what else could be true? The moment you get angry about a particular thing, keep asking yourself, but what else could be true? Do I actually know everything there is to know about this situation? What else could be true? So you keep, that, you keep in that place of childlike wonder and childlike awe, okay? Very important. Um, the next thing is practice mind, what I call mind share audits. In other words, where you audit your thought life. So you can say to yourself, in the last 30 minutes, what have I actually been thinking of? Or has my mind become passive? In Philippians 3.19, it says, their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, right? Their mind is set on earthly things. So what's your mind set on? And you only know this if you regularly do mind share audits, okay? We like to audit so many things. We're very much into actual things that you can see and touch. But how many of us audit our thought life? Okay, 
And there's a way you can actually unpack that. I'm not going to go into it right now, but there's a way you can unpack that. Romans 8 verse 7, I like this scripture too. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Okay, that's the mind that's governed by the flesh. In other words, your, your sinful nature. Okay, so here are some questions for you. What is governing your mind, the flesh or the spirit? Because that will affect your emotional state. Okay, what is your mind set on? In other words, what are your default thoughts? Just think about that. What are your default thoughts? So when you're trying to focus on one particular thing, what do you end up thinking about? Okay. Conduct regular emotional activity logs. Very important. How was I feeling in the last 30 minutes? Okay. What is the message from that emotion? What does that say about the state of my mind? Another powerful question is this. How was my mind contaminated today? How was it actually contaminated today? How was it weakened today? How was it defiled today? Okay. Another question, what lies am I carrying in my mind today? And these could be lies about yourself. Like, oh, I'm stupid. People like me will never make it. A village girl like me, no, I'm not cut out for these things. I was believing my own press. Lies about other people. Oh, they've got an unfair advantage in life. Are people like them, they're the liked ones. Oh, he did well because he's so good looking. That's the only reason. Okay. What about lies about God? God has bypassed me. I've messed up in my life. There's no chance for me. Oh, because I'm already 45, you know, and this is where I'm at in my life. You know what? I think I was dreaming too big. That's how God is. I think God changed his mind about me. But he doesn't. He's not double-minded about you. Okay. Sometimes we've, we've got lies about how the world works, you know? Competition is bad, someone always gets hurt. Conflict is bad, someone always gets hurt, okay? So this is how the enemy takes us captive. The enemy is not powerful over you. He's powerful over you to the degree to which you believe his lies and his schemes. That's why the Bible talks about how we're not unaware of the trickery, the schemes of the devil, okay? So watch out for that. <clears throat> Key question. What truth can I use to displace the lies with? Okay. How has my mind affected my emotional state today? Powerful question. Okay. Why is it good to have these types of orders? It's good to have these orders because when you measure something, the more you measure something, measuring where you're at, right, the more likely you are to get better, to basically improve. So when I go for a run, I'm looking and seeing what's my average pace, what's my average pace. Those of you who are runners know what I'm talking about, okay? Why am I doing that? I'm doing that because I want to be improving. Because if I just go by how I'm feeling, I might sometimes think I'm running quite fast. But then when I look at my average pace, I realize, wait a minute, I'm going, on, I'm going slightly uphill and I've actually slowed down a bit. So let me push a bit more. So it's the same with these emotional audits. You're assessing yourself and saying, am I in a good space or not? right? How am I coming across? Very, very important, okay? So there are two pillars of emotional management, right, that I want to highlight as we're speaking, okay? Two pillars of, um, of emotional intelligence that I want to talk about, okay? The first is emotional self-awareness, okay? A lot of people aren't actually aware of their emotional state, okay? Let me ask you a question. How are you feeling? People often say to me, Paul, I need vocab for that. Paul, can you help me with vocab? I just need more vocab, right? For how I'm actually feeling. Okay. Right. It, a lot of us come from non-reflexive cultures. Right? That's why I say to people, how do you say in Zulu, uh, honey, I just felt so insecure with my boss today. How do you actually say that? Some people have to go to the dictionary to look for that word for insecure. Okay. Um, when we're growing up, our parents were interested in, did you do well in, work, in class or not? You know, we didn't really talk about how we felt emotionally towards the teacher for the most part. Okay. So um, we need vocab when it comes to emotion. You see, your, your words are your thoughts in symbolic form. And you only have words for things. Okay. You only have words for specific things that you can conceptualize. So if you don't conceptualize some of these emotions, then you don't have the words for it. So the French, for example, have a word for uh, the gap between the bed and the wall, entre lit, right? 
um, the Spanish love football, right? They love soccer, and they've got a word for the back of the net, okay? In our African culture and tradition, we've got a different word for your uncle on your father's side and your uncle on your mother's side, and we relate to those people differently, don't we? Okay, so we need to actually expand our vocab when it comes to emotion. And what's so powerful is when you can articulate your emotion accurately, it actually connects you better with other people. So it's one thing, to, if I say to you, how are you feeling? And you're like, good. I'm like, what do you mean by good? Are you, are you, when you say good, do you mean you're feeling excited, energetic, eager, amazed, right? Can you see the difference? And, it, and then our communication goes deeper. That's emotional self-awareness. When you're also emotionally self-aware, you know the impact your emotional state has on the people around you. So I know that when I'm feeling really excited, sometimes it actually is overwhelming for some people around me who just want to, who want calm. Sometimes it's too much, okay? That's just an example. So do you know how your emotions affect the people around you? So some of the key questions to ask yourself for emotional self-awareness is, what am I really feeling, right? And what's the degree of the emotion? Sometimes people exaggerate everything, you know? Oh man, you know, like, oh, that was such a terrible day. No, it was maybe a terrible moment during the day. Oh, my job is so draining. I remember saying to a person, um, no, your job isn't draining. You have draining moments at work. And sometimes when you actually do an emotional log on yourself, you realize, oh yeah, my, I shouldn't keep saying my job is draining. I have draining moments at work. And those, those draining moments are when I have meetings with person X, they suck the life out of me because the person has got this heaviness about them and they're so, so detailed and pedantic. That's why, oh, so my job isn't draining. I have draining moments and it's around that guy. Why was I so energized this week? Oh, it was because this dude was actually on, was, was on leave, okay? So it's important to be accurate about emotional state and be careful what you actually say about yourself. How many of you say things like, oh, I'm, not good. I'm not good with names. If, if that's you, stop saying that because the way your subconscious works, it's like a little man in the basement. The moment you say, I'm not good with names, that little man in the basement goes to the section of your brain that remembers names and shuts it down. It says, we don't remember names here. I'm not going to go into the psychology of why that happens, okay? But that's actually what happens. But if I start saying, you know what? I'm improving with names. I actually know my dad is called John. My mom is called Rosemary. My, brother is, my brothers are Dave, uh, James, and Will. My friends are Temba, Sandile, Wimbai. You know what I mean, right? Can you see what's actually happening, right? That's my subconscious, like a little man in the basement will go, the section of the brain that remembers names is, we remember names around you and starts remembering. So be careful what you say, okay? What are the debilitating rules you've created that are impacting your current emotional state? Let me give you a quick example of this. Debilate, debilitating rules, okay? I was coaching someone, they're about 37 years of age at the time, and I said to her, what's draining you? And she said, you know what, Paul, as a working mom, it's my kids. Often my kids just want to play with me and so on, but we're renovating the house and I find it really draining. And I said, your kids don't drain you. Your kids don't stress you out. The thing that's stressing you out and draining you is a debilitating rule that you've created for yourself. And this is the rule. The rule you've created for yourself is that I need to be a mom like my mom was. And her mom was a classic nurturer. She had passed away some months earlier. She was a classic nurturer, okay? And she said, Paul, you're spot on. You're so right. It's not just my mom. It's also my sister. My sister is an occupational therapist, and she's always telling us, do this with the kids, do that with the kids. And, and it puts that pressure on me. And I said to her, do you know what your kids need? They need a mom like you. Not like your mom, not like someone else. They need a mom like you, how you are wired, right? Um, they probably need a mom who likes working with them. That's what energizes you, isn't it, right? Then she said, yeah, but I felt so bad about it. I felt so guilty, Paul, right? Can you see she was feeling guilty because of the debilitating rule? I felt so guilty because they joined us and they were helping us all day on Saturday. And I said, well, how did the kids feel? She said, they loved it. They loved it, okay? So what are the debilitating rules, the shoulds that you've created that are impacting your current emotional state, okay? 
Are there any burdens that you've placed on yourself that Jesus hasn't put there? Because what Jesus says in the word of God is, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Often we get into certain emotional states because we are putting burdens on ourselves that God hasn't even put there. Okay? Ask yourself, is this emotion empowering me or debilitating me? Is what I'm doing right now helping me or harming me? Am I contributing to my health or am I contaminating my health? Okay? Do you know how you are poisoning your body by being emotionally triggered continuously? If you're triggered, for example, by traffic cutting in in front of you, you're flooding your body with cortisol when you're in that triggered state, hey? When you're emotionally triggered into a negative state, you're flooding your body with cortisol and it stays there for a good four hours. That's your stress hormone. It stays there for a good four hours. And it's difficult for you to be productive when you've got cortisol all over your, in your system. Okay? And for one dose of negative emotion that you've got, you actually need five doses of positive emotion to flush out the negative. Okay? That's just how it works. I'm not going to go deep into it, but that's just how it works. Okay? As human beings. So imagine you're triggered by someone cutting in the traffic, right? They, it's, let's say eight in the morning, right? Cortisol flooding your system for a good four hours. You've wasted half your day. At noon, you have a big fight with your boss. You're triggered again. That's another four hours. Your whole day is gone. So the trick when you're in a triggered state is to be able to actually say to yourself, what else could be true? To reinterpret, to press pause, and reinterpret that situation, okay? I wanna, let me, just, let me just say this before we break into the breakout rooms. The way your emotional triggers work, they work a bit like this. If a lion walks through the door, what are you gonna do, okay? Some of you will, will just freeze. Some of you will bore a hole through that window, okay? Some of you will take out weapons that you had, had not declared, and it's hunting time now right? Fight, flight, or freeze. That's what typically happens. But you know that your brain doesn't distinguish between a lion walking through the door and a time where you're giving a presentation and a senior stakeholder who intimidates you walks through the door. That's why you hear people saying, I felt so mortified. I felt I could just freeze. Ah, oh, you know, I wanted to just die, Paul, because you wanted to escape from the situation. You flooded by that cortisol, fight, flight, or freeze. Happens to a lot of people. Now, when you're in that triggered state, start asking yourself different questions. Firstly, what actually is triggering you? Some people are triggered by chauvinism. When that happens, and I remember one lady in one of my sessions said, Paul, you know, I'm triggered by chauvinism. If I just walk past the boardroom and I see it's just men only, it just does something to me. When you're in that situation, ask yourself, first of all, pause, what else could be true? How do I really know that these men are chauvinists, that they don't like women, or misogynists, hatred of women? What if they've been trying to invite women to these meetings and women said no? Okay, so you give yourself the different alternatives. What else could be true? Then you ask yourself, where does this thing come from? And in some people's case, they might say, you know what? I grew up in a family where there were boys and girls, and my parents just poured money into my brother's education, but we were cleverer than the boys and they, they didn't pour into our education. So I resented it and I made an inner vow and my inner vow was never again am I gonna let men take advantage of me. Paul, I think that's where it comes from. That's what's triggering me. And then don't let it control you anymore, okay? So uh, I'm gonna hand over to Temba. Um, these are some more of the questions, okay? I'm gonna hand over to Temba and uh, he's gonna just give us some direction in terms of the breakout rooms. And then we'll continue when you get back. But well, some powerful Paul, questions. You, you gave us a lot to chew on there. Uh, thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, folks, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to break into the breakaway rooms for 15 minutes now. And um, what I'd encourage you to do is um, the following. Please have a look in the chat um, group. Do you see the chat group? Um, it should be at the bottom um, space bar, uh, pop up bar, uh, pop up menu at the bottom. Uh, if you press the chat, um, and you'll see the questions for tonight. Um, in your groups, uh, introduce yourselves to each other, 
and uh, try and chew on a couple of these questions. Maybe pick two or three. Um, 15 minutes flies past, um, but it's always great to um, chew on um, some things, share what you're thinking, and uh, get some different perspectives. Yeah. So our groups are going to go for the next 15 minutes. Uh, everyone should be in a group. And um, see you guys shortly. So uh, for the resilience is positive adaptation in the face of adversity. Positive adaptation in the face of adversity, right? It's basically where you are able to bounce back quickly from setbacks, okay? So a lot of people are not resilient. And resilience is quite an emotional thing, isn't it? A lot of people collapse very easily. Other people actually bounce back. So right now we're in a time of lockdown, but some people have the mindset of, let me feel sorry for myself. Other people are like, what's the opportunity in the calamity, right? And it's called asset-based thinking, where you write out negative situations and next to each negative situation, you write out the opportunity that's within the calamity. It's not just the power of positive thinking. It's actually saying, I'm acknowledging the negative here, but I'm going to pour my energy and strength and focus into what I can get out of it, okay? Very, very powerful. Sometimes when we talk about resilience, we associate it with, main, with, with health, don't we? Say my kids were so resilient, they lasted right through winter without catching the flu. So I'm gonna ask you, what flu are you catching? And I'm speaking metaphorically here. In other words, when someone else at work starts coughing, do you start sneezing? When they become negative, do you also become negative? Resilience is being able to block out the naysayers. So when you've got your favorite football star and he's playing at his former home ground, what do they do? They boo him, don't they? But it's wonderful when you see him, despite the booing, you see him still dribble through everyone and scoring. Okay? Um, so that's important. I want to highlight that in terms of being a resilient, um, a resilient person. Okay? So in addition to emotional resilience, which we, what, what we're talking about right now, there's psychological resilience, there's physical resilience, there's community resilience, the resilience of a family, of a community, okay? Um, and that's quite important. So you're actually training your mind with resilience. You're training your mind to respond differently to negative situations, right? You're training your mind to respond differently to negative situations, right? And the nice thing about resilience is that it's a competency that you can actually develop and you can actually grow in. And it's been found that people who are resilient, one of the things they've got in common is they've accepted that in life we'll face hardships. So they embrace it. Well, there'll be suffering, there'll be persecution, there'll be difficult times, but it doesn't bring you down. But other people have got this mindset of like, oh, this bad thing has happened, and then they can't cope. Okay, they're surprised by it. Okay, that's why Jesus actually said, you know what, guys, a servant is not greater than his master. So if you, if, so if they've hated me, they'll also hate you. He was basically priming them for those types of challenges. The problem we have on the African continent is we don't have, we've just got an oral tradition. So we don't always write down things and communicate them to the next generation. So a lot of us had grandparents and parents that were very resilient, but we didn't understand the science of resilience, what made them bounce back, okay? And resilience is so, so crucial, and that's why I'm emphasizing it, because it helps us to actually avoid depression, anxiety, and stress. And when you look at the stats, one out of eight adults have anxiety, one out of six have depression, one out of three are experiencing stress. But when you're a resilient person, you actually avoid that. And those three things I've mentioned, depression, anxiety, and stress, they're a major cause of a lot of the diseases that people are facing today. I like what Lucy Hone said, um, and she's got really brilliant stuff on resilience if you listen to a TED talk and things like that. Um, she says, don't lose what you have to what you have lost. She lost tragically one of her kids uh, through, through an accident, and she was grieving that and so focused on that. And then she just got reminded of the fact that, you know what, she's also still got a son who needs love and who needs a parent. So she was like, don't lose what you currently have because of what you've lost. And I, I don't know what you are grieving right now. Go through the grieving process. 
but also make sure that you're fully emotionally present for those who are there. And the trick is benefit finding. Some people call it mining the good stuff. But in a negative situation, what's the good stuff? We've had the lockdown, but in the period of the lockdown, I've been so grateful because I've had more time to basically produce and end up developing this, this wonderful online platform, you know, with online courses, right? Um, I use that opportunity while other people are complaining, right? And companies are now signing up and so on. The business school I do some things for has signed up for it in one of the courses I do. That's benefit finding, okay? So it's important to know what the competencies of a resilient person are. They deal with their emotional triggers that I was talking about. Do you know what triggers you, right? They respond well, not just fight, flight, or freeze, okay? They ask themselves the right questions when they're triggered. What else could be true? Do you know everything about the situation? Where does the trigger come from? How did I learn this response? Why has it become a habit, okay? What's the, what are the debilitating rules? What are the remedies, okay? Where have I experienced this before? What's important to me about this, okay? They're aware of all these things. Are you getting your emotions to work for you? And then finally, are you taking ownership of these emotions? Are you functioning from a place of victim stance where you're a victim? So this is the ladder of power. Those who are powerful will make it happen. They'll seek solutions. They'll own the situation they're in. Those who are emotionally victims will blame other people and will make excuses. I think let me end here because of time. Uh, and I think we're pretty much done. So guys, I'm open to questions. I'll answer the, the first one that I saw by uh, Chel Chelana. Chelana. I popped into their group and um, I'm going to stop the share now. I popped into their group and he was explaining what his name means. Someone asked him, what does your name mean? I think, I think you said yellow boned or something, hey? And everyone was laughing. So um, he's got yeah. a question. And in the chat, you'll all see his question. Um, and it's basically to do with the whole concept of the balance between uh, suppressing how you're really feeling and having a genuine bulletproof self-image. So I think a key thing there is make sure you're not numbing. Make sure you're not numbing yourself. You can't compartmentalize numbing. So when you numb yourself from negative emotions, okay, you're also numbing yourself from feeling joyful. So the way you know that you're in numbing mode and suppressing mode is you find yourself also suppressing other things holistically. That's just one of the things. So when that person treats you in a particular way or in a particular situation, yes, you might not be um, pulled back by it, but how do you actually feel about the situation? It's important to be able to articulate how you feel about it, even if it's a positive emotion. If you can't, then it means maybe you're in numbing mode where you're just suppressing, okay? Um, that's just, that's, that's one of the principles. I, I had to learn about that uh, in terms of being emotionally honest. I see myself as a very positive person who looks for opportunities and is positive. Um, so I found myself having a bit of a pattern where I would leave an environment. It could be a particular client, but the reasoning for it would be something like, ah, oh, I was getting bored or, ah, oh, you know what? I needed a new challenge. And I was lying to myself because if I was emotionally honest, the truth would have been, I got discouraged. I felt discouraged, you see? So it's important to actually be emotionally honest, okay? Um, let me have a look at some of, the, some of the other questions that are coming through. We got okay, quite what are some of the questions here, Paul? Sorry? We got quite a few more questions yeah. here. Um, yeah, I see wait. that. I can see that. Okay, cool. So um, let me, let me see who, okay. 
How do you, this is Amanda, how do you not feed off your spouse's negative emotions when you're in such close proximity of each other all the time? Very good question, Amanda. Okay, so, so here's the thing. It's so important not to be codependent, okay? It's so important not to be codependent. And the way you do this is by being proactive about your emotional state. You see, often we've got like this blank slate and we haven't decided how we are going to be. So by default, we end up just going to how the other person is. The trick in emotional resilience is to actually decide. So a lot of times we're good at preparing to go to work, but a lot of people are not good at preparing to go back home afterwards. When I'm going back home from work, I have to start putting my dad cap on. I have to start putting my husband cap on and deciding how I'm going to be because how I am is going to actually shape the emotional climate at home. When you're conscious of it, you then guard yourself, which is a boundary when your spouse is in another mood, right? And it, it takes practice. This isn't just a quick thing that happens overnight. You see, it takes practice being resilient that way. Okay. Um, hi, Paul. Thank you. Struck by this ladder you shared. How do we process the emotions tied to racism and yet be emotionally responsible to participate um, in and driving change forward? That's so important. If you're a believer, thanks, Tans. If you're a believer, it's so important to have Jesus' perspective on these things. And when you have the mind of Christ, it means you have the reasoning of Christ. And you're able to forgive because you can see things from other people's context. So there's what's called prior learning. So we had a friend at Varsity. Uh, we had friends, uh, Rom, Romuald and Sarah. And Rom was from Rwanda and Sarah was from South Africa. Romuald, tall, dark, black guy. Sarah, tall, uh, you know, striking blonde hair, white girl, right? And there was a time when they were in East London. They just got married in East London, walking together as husband and wife. A guy slows down his vehicle and says to Sarah, um, is everything okay, ma'am? Okay. And that's based on prior learning. Now, you can get angry and react, or you can say, you know what? This person has limited exposure, so let me educate them. And, we, and that's how I, I deal with um, discrimination. And it happens all the time. I'll go in as a coach about to do a talk in an organization. I remember this happening. Arrive. Someone will assume the vehicle that I'm driving because it was a nice car that I may be a driver from that particular, um, you know, dealership or something like that. And then I had to educate the person. Why can't someone who looks like me be driving a vehicle like this? Okay. But I wasn't angry with them. I got the best customer service excellence experience from that particular individual. So when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. So he was able to be forgiving because he could see things from someone else's perspective, their limited world. And that's why we have to sometimes say to ourselves, you know what? If I grew up in the same environment as that individual, was brainwashed in the same way, I wonder how I would see the world, you see? Um, sometimes that helps. I know it's a whole workshop and so on. I've got one of my books is actually on diversity, a biblical view of diversity. And I unpack how do you actually, uh, how's prejudice formed, right? And how do you actually get free from it and so on? Brilliant question though, okay? Um, okay, uh, uh, let's see. Which one is the next question here? So there was Amanda's, um, there was uh, Wussi's, how do you effectively break out of negative self-talk? Okay. Um, you be kind to yourself, first of all. So you respect yourself. Just like you respect other people, you respect yourself. That I can't just keep saying these particular things. Okay. You get so much into the word of God, scriptures, so that whatever automatically comes out of your mouth is aligned to uh, what you've been accustomed to of uh, with with what god says about you that's very important so i would say practice affirmations the thing about affirmations is that they're done in present tense 
I wrote down some affirmations in 2004. I was in Seattle at the time, wrote them out, right? I still have them today. I don't use them every day, but um, a lot of the stuff has happened that's in those affirmations. For example, in 2004, I said, I'm grateful that I am writing world-class material that's influencing the continent as a reformer on our continent. That's what I said. I only did my first book in 2005, but 2004, I was stating it in present tense, okay? That impacts your subconscious. The second thing about affirmations is you state them in the positive. If you've got a temper issue, you don't say, uh, I don't have a bad temper, I don't have a bad temper, I don't have a bad temper, because your subconscious is just hearing temper, temper, temper. Not temper, my lover, tem, temper, okay? <laughs> anyway, that's what your subconscious is just hearing, okay? So the trick is to be able to say, I'm learning to be patient with slower people, right? So you state that. You also put emotion to it because emotion is the glue, right? That connects your words to and embeds those words into beliefs. So you have a series of thoughts. The thoughts become a belief because of the glue of emotion. That's why when you have a traumatic experience, it's quite emotional, isn't it? So be careful what you say about yourself and what you think about yourself while you're feeling strong feelings, like traumatic emotional feelings, because it gets embedded. So the trick is when you're now doing what's called belief repatterning, is to actually use emotion, say it with passion. You see, very powerful. Then you also mix your, your self-talk with visualization. You actually visual, you see yourself doing it. And you see this throughout scripture. Jesus would say, I do only what I see my father doing. So he had a vision, he was seeing things, and then he acted. So how do you see yourself? If you're afraid of public speaking, the night before in a relaxed state, see yourself speaking in front of people. Are they laughing at your jokes? Are you confident? Are you powerful in how you are, right? See yourself doing it and then get into the emotional state that you want to be in when you're giving that presentation so that so you become as accustomed to a powerful emotion, a positive emotion, you see. And then when the fear tries to come in, you see the fear as a foreign entity. So it's about practicing the emotional state, emotional conditioning. Okay. Um, someone was asking, was someone asking about uh, uh, books, like books? on these topics. I think someone has asked me about books on emotional intelligence. Okay. Uh, standard good ones, if you want to just understand the basics of emotional intelligence is obviously Daniel Goleman, but uh, like, obviously like these aren't necessarily by Christian people and so on. So you have to chew the meat and spit out the bones. Okay. Um, but he's kind of seen as the fundi on emotional intelligence and has written a lot of good stuff on it. Okay. Um, I would also say in terms of some of the mind stuff I've been talking about, I would also suggest there's a book by a lady called Susie Casey, Susie as an S-U-Z-E, uh, Susie Casey, and it's called Belief Repatterning, and it's very good in terms of the mind and, and so on, okay? And then obviously, obviously my books also that Timber showed you at the start, um, you can get those on Amazon, just Paul Yamuda Amazon, you can get those. Uh, okay, question from Rotok. A number of our emotional mannerisms have been with us so long that they become part of our character. How long does it take to overcome them as a habit? Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, Rotok, I'll encourage you to go onto YouTube and just do say Paul Nyamuda and then just say habits, okay? Uh, empowering habits. There's a whole sermon I did on how to form empowering habits. And one of the myths out there is that it takes just 21 days. And I actually break it down and explain why it's not just 21 days, okay? Research has actually been carried out on it, okay? And it took, uh, for some people it was uh, about, I think it was six weeks, and other people it was like eight months, okay? So it also depends what you're doing depends on what you're doing while the habits are being formed, okay? So do you have a routine around it, okay? Do you have a reward around the habit that you're trying to develop, okay? So please, if you go onto YouTube, you'll see Paul Nyamuda and Empowering Habits. Just watch that, that I unpack it in detail, okay? Uh, so it takes some time. 
Paul, your uh, personality. Is cool. Yeah, sorry, Timber. And finish your statement. I was just going to say your personality is formed in the first 10 years of your life. So usually the stuff that was formed during that time uh, becomes a part of our personality. It's often difficult to actually break out of it, but it is possible to change. You've got the life of God in you, Zoe, God's life. Amen. Uh, wonderful, Paul. Thank you so much for um, a really wonderful workshop. Our time is gone. Um, we're about 10 minutes over uh, our allocated uh, period of time. Thank you so much for your input. Um, Paul, could I um, ask you one question to help us segue? Um, uh, folks, there will be prayer that's available afterwards. Um, for those of you who are visiting, if you'd like to know more about um, our church, Every Nation Sunning Hill, um, please uh, have a look in the, in the chat section. Uh, there'll be a link um, to, that's called a connection card. And um, we'll be able to connect with you. We'd love to pray for you as well. So you'll see there's a link um, in the chat room that's going to say, um, it'll, it'll appear shortly. And, it, and it'll say a prayer uh, opportunity. But uh, also at the end of this session, um, if you'd like to stay behind, we've got uh, some of our prayer counselors here. And they'll be more than happy to spend some moments praying with you if you'd like to. We'd love to offer that to you. But Paul, the question that I want to ask you as we segue to the end is the importance of being forgiven uh, versus forgiving others. Often we talk about the importance of forgiving others, but the importance of being forgiven, how does that impact us um, in, in our lives? Awesome. Thank you so much, Timba. I've never been asked that question before. Um, and I always say great leaders don't have all the answers. They know how to ask good questions that get to the heart of the matter. So um, <clears throat> a lot of people have a revelation about forgiveness, that God has forgiven me of my sin, okay? But they don't have a revelation of the fact that he's made me righteous, okay? I've become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, because he died for me on the cross, shed his blood, okay, bought me back, redeemed me, when he looks at me, he now sees Jesus, okay? Because I'm in Christ. The Bible says I'm, hid, I'm, I'm hidden in, Christ, in God. I'm hidden with Christ in God, which is a very powerful statement. And what that does when I know I've been forgiven, it liberates me from shame. So a lot of people are still living at the same shame level that they did when they were outside of Christ. Hmm. But throughout scripture, we, we, we're taught, uh, we've been cleansed from a guilty conscience. So he forgives us of our sin and he delivers us from a guilty conscience. Yes. When I'm free from that shame, I now have this super, I'm confident, a confidence that comes from Christ. I'm free to love. I can only love with proper agape love, unconditional love, if I first received it from God. If I've received his love and his delight and his forgiveness, it's easier for me now to flow with that to other people. So I think it's so crucial, bro. That's wonderful, Paul. Um, and I think the liberation that comes um, from the love of God, um, when we receive the forgiveness that we have, all of us have messed up. We've done stuff in our lives. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all messed up. But there comes that moment where um, beyond our own abilities to fix ourselves, God offers us a gift and that gift is found in Christ Jesus. And it's the gift of forgiveness. It's the gift of being reconnected into a relationship with God. And it's a gift of a new life and a new future with God. And um, let me summarize it in this one verse. Um, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 puts it this way. It says that, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden. That sounds like COVID-19 lockdown right there. And so Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Um, folks, you know, um, Paul's given us lots of tools, but we're convinced, Paul and myself, that more than these great tools, the deepest need of every human being is to receive Jesus Christ. He really makes a difference in our lives. And I'd love to um, pray with you to receive Jesus Christ. And if you'd like to do that, um, please um, fill out the connection card. Uh, which you'll see a link to. Um, it's a bit.ly link, and um, we would love 
to chat to you more about giving your life to Jesus. Okay, so we're going to end with a prayer. And um, then if you'd love to stay on and receive prayer, uh, you're welcome to. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this um, great impartation of wisdom and understanding. And um, I pray that we'll be able to manage our emotional world um, much better than we have before. We need your help to do this. And Father, I want to pray for those who don't know you and who'd like to start a relationship with you. They want that forgiveness and freedom that comes with Christ. And if that's you, you can pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Father God, I thank you that you sent Jesus, your son, to die for me on the cross. Jesus, thank you for dying for me on the cross, for forgiving me of all my sin. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. And from this day forward, I commit myself to growing in my relationship with you. Father God, help me, change me, transform me in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, we'd love to help you to grow in your relationship with God. Um, again, uh, you'll see the connection card um, in the chat room, and we'd love to um, connect with you. Paul Nyamuda, thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about. Yes, come on, let's give him a hand and clap. Uh, some of you might know this. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sound effects. And everything. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, you really have been a blessing to us this evening. And uh, again, please check out um, the material that Paul has on his website at uh, paulnyamuda.com. Uh, his books are awesome. Uh, you can find them on Amazon. Uh, really phenomenal stuff. For those of you who'd like to uh, receive prayer, we'll be available for prayer. Anything you'd like to say in conclusion, Paul? Uh, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege and I enjoyed it. And it was great to see so many people connecting and um, let's keep growing in this. It's a journey.